Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about Abraham Maslow and his theory of the hierarchy of needs. So all about Maslow, there's a picture of him, isn't he so cute with his little smile? Um, but he was born in Brooklyn, New York on April 1st, 1908, and no, that's not a joke. He died June 8th, 1970, and a fun fact about him, he married his first cousin, Bertha Goodman, against the wishes of his family. Okay, moving on. He was also known for his theory on the hierarchy of needs. So how the theory came about was early in his career, he worked with monkeys, and he noticed that some needs preceded others. So for example, if you're hungry and thirsty, you're going to get water first because thirst is a bigger need. But also, if you're in danger and you're thirsty, you're going to want to get out of danger before you get water. So through this, he created the hierarchy of needs, which have five levels, which we're going to talk about. And they are physiological needs, safety, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. And here's a pyramid showing all of them. Um, so moving on, first we have our physiological needs, which as you can see is the base of our pyramid. Um, and these are things our body needs to exist, like food, air, water, nutrients, also things like sleep, exercise, sex, need to avoid pain, the need to avoid danger, things like that. Um, these needs are very individualized depending on person to person and a lack of a certain need leads to a craving. So for example, if you're lacking um, vitamin C, you might crave orange juice. So next up, we have our safety needs, which as you can see is the second layer of the pyramid. Um, and before we can address this layer, prior needs need to be met. Um, this layer includes things like safety, security, protection, stability, um, and these needs not being met can lead to fear or worry. So next up, we have belonging needs, which is our third level of the pyramid. Um, and again, prior needs must be met or mostly taken care of. You can still address this level of the pyramid even if all of your other needs aren't fully met. Um, so this is the need for a sense of connection. So these are your relationships, your friendships, um, your significant others, your need for a community. Um, and a lack of this can lead to loneliness and social anxiety. Next up is our esteem needs, and here we have lower and higher esteem, and no, that is not lower self-esteem. Um, lower esteem is respect from others, fame, glory, attention, so really your validation from others. Next, we have higher esteem, which is self-respect, confidence, independence, achievement. Really, this is just validation from yourself. You don't need other people to tell you how good you are, and a lack of this is feeling inferior or having low self-esteem. Ooh. So these needs are deficit needs, or D needs, and they're the bottom four needs on the pyramid. And with these needs, if you feel a need, then you fix the need. And if there's no need, then you feel nothing, or homeostasis, which means everything in your body or your life is equal and balanced and nothing needs to be fixed. And these needs are essential for survival. You cannot survive without them. Your body has adapted to have these needs. Um, that's why they're called instinctoid or instinctive needs. So continuing on, um, all of these, all of our needs move in stages and stressful times can move us backwards. So for example, you might be doing great and then all of a sudden you run into financial issues. So you go back into the need of safety and needing some stability in your life. Um, also, we can fixate on needs, which will, there it is. We can fixate on needs if we have a traumatic event in our lives. So for example, if you grew up with food instability, even if you have a stable amount of food in your life, you may still fixate on that and feel like you need more food. Um, so this last layer we have is called self-actualization, and it's kind of different than our other layers. Um, it's called being needs or be needs, self-actualization, you know, another name. Um, and it doesn't need homeostasis. Um, so the goal of self-actualization is to be all that you can be. And kind of how Maslow figured this one out was he looked at certain people throughout history that had achieved self-actualization. And he said, okay, what did they have? How did they get there? So for example, some people that he looked at were like Abraham Lincoln. And so he looked at them and listed qualities. And some of the qualities are here. Um, reality centered, they were very down to earth, problem centered. So they looked at the world through as a problem and things that they could solve. Um, they believed in the journey over the destination. Um, they enjoyed their solitude. They um, didn't need to be with people, but they did still have close friends. Um, but they enjoyed being by themselves. They didn't feel the need to fit in. Um, they accepted themselves and others. So there was a lot of contributions and limits to this theory. 
Um, so the good things was that he's brought people's attentions back to psychology, and he was one of the pioneers of humanistic psychology. Um, some of the criticisms of his theory was that his theory of self-actualization wasn't done very scientifically. Um, he seemed to pick and choose people that he thought had achieved self-actualization, and he did some of this through biographical analysis, where he read biographies and then picked out qualities. Um, not a very scientific method. The idea of self-actualization is also very limited. Maslow believed only about 2% actually achieved it. So how does this apply to teaching? Well, it actually applies a lot in the classroom. You see, once this was brought about, teachers realized um, a lot about teaching. They realized that before educational needs can be met, physiological needs must be met first. So if a student isn't learning, it's very probable that their other needs aren't being met. So they might be hungry or they might not feel safe or perhaps it's things at home that the teacher can't control. But it also changed the environment of the classroom because to learn, kids must feel respected. They have to have a positive environment where those esteem needs are met. Otherwise, learning can't happen. And learning kind of takes place in the self-actualization category. Um, that doesn't make peop these people self-actualize, but all of these needs must be met before learning can really take place. Um, Maslow asserted that teachers following humanistic psychology in their teaching would make students who are stronger, healthier, and that would take their lives, own lives into their own hands to a greater extent. Um, so Maslow really had a great strategy here and it really influenced teachers in the classroom and the classroom environments. So that is my presentation and I hope you enjoyed.